Is that working? Yes? All right. Good morning. Wow. I think that, you know, what we've already seen here this morning is exactly what is phenomenal about Gallup, New Mexico. We have the Community Health Action Group. The members of this group have put in, I'm sure they have no idea how many hours, I certainly don't, endless hours, because they care about the health of this community, because they care about our local hospital. We have Dylan Solomon, our ER director, who worked countless shifts, countless hours during the public health crisis of our generation and was terminated from our institution. These are concerning times, but I'm so impressed by all of you being here, speaking up, standing up, advocating for our patients, for our community, and by the potential of what we all bring together. In about 10 days, I think, will be the two year anniversary of the first COVID patient that was admitted to RMCH. And I remember that day like it was yesterday. At that time, we had no idea what we were facing. We'd heard reports from overseas. We'd heard reports from Seattle. The thought was that the mortality rate could be 10, 15%. It was really, really scary times. That very first patient we had uh, to do some challenging things, some things that really put our staff at risk. And I remember the dedication and the selflessness with which every single nurse, healthcare worker, provider that took care of that patient did the risk they might be putting themselves or their family at. That's our community. That's the healthcare workers that, that we have or had. In 2010, I moved to McKinley County. I worked for Zuni EIHS uh, for many years, as Dr. Lee mentioned. Uh, and then in 2018, moved up to uh, RMCH and became the chief medical officer. Uh, in November of that year, my son was born uh, right there on the second floor. Uh, and what an incredible experience that was. I remember, again, just so clearly walking in and seeing Mary Apple with her decades of clinical experience there and how reassured my family felt to know that she would be there to care for us, uh, that all of the nursing staff, it, it was such an incredible group of women's health nurses that had put in decades, combined to decades of caring for our community. And they did so with such love and care and skill that we absolutely had no doubt that it was the right decision to have our care at home and to have our son born just across the street here. When I look at the Women's Health Unit now, I see none of those nurses. There's been such huge attrition of staff, of nurses, of providers. It's a completely different place. That is what we stand to lose. That is what we are losing under the current administration. And I think that the survey really says something important. These colleagues are not leaving because they want better pay. They're not leaving because they want to move to the big city. They're leaving because they want to provide safe, high quality, excellent care to our community and find themselves unable to do so, unable to speak up whenever they have safety concerns, unable to do their jobs without fear of retaliation. Our community deserves better than that. That's the reason, as Dr. Liu discussed, that we lost our, all of our OB providers. We had an excellent set of OB providers that, again, had moved to this community, were determined to be here, in fact, largely still are, but are now seeking or working uh, in other places in the community. And I would have to say that there's still really phenomenal people, people working day in and day out at RMCH. 
really just the most dedicated, hardworking folks you could imagine. Uh, as I mentioned, we had uh, four, sometimes five OB providers at RMCH. We now have Dr. Marcy Richmond, uh, OB trained family medicine doc, caring for all of the clinic patients that those five providers used to see. She's working absolutely without a break, day in, day out, day in, day out, trying to make sure that someone is meeting the need of, that, of those patients that otherwise would have to go to Grants or Albuquerque or somewhere outside of our community, which again, we just had our second year, a lot of prenatal visits. It is not easy to have all of your prenatal care somewhere else. And I am just so honored to have been able to work beside her and see how the city is how dedicated, how determined she was to continue to provide that care, even under the most challenging of circumstances. The administration consistently says, oh, there's a national nursing shortage. Oh, the nurses want more money. Survey, none of the, very few of those people have got exit interviews. So how do we know? How does the administration know? And thank you to the CHAG for doing the hard work needed to find out those answers and to know that people aren't leaving for more, for more money. They're leaving because they care and they wanna do the right thing. And it's hard to do that at this institution. I'll speak a little bit to the retaliation question um, because I, again, hear over and over, oh, we don't believe in retaliation. That's not something we do. It's not one of our values. Uh, and so I'll just speak a little bit to, to my own experience. I think that my personal experience with retaliation started in fall of last year uh, when I was called in and uh, disciplined for um, release of patient information to the media and violation of the social media policy. So I printed out my Facebook account. I Googled myself in the news. Couldn't find, I just couldn't figure out what it was that they were referring to. So I sat down with my supervisor and said, you know, explain this to me. I don't, I don't understand what it is that, that I'm in trouble for. And the answer I got was, oh, well, you know, actually it's that you express concerns to someone of, uh, uh, I forget the words, uh, stature in the community, something like that, that got escalated and now we might be in trouble for it. And then that uh, disciplinary action stayed on my file. There was no attempt to change that or modify that or rectify that situation. A couple months later, there certainly the, uh, the physician uni unionization has been, um, has, caused great, um, it's really bothered the current administration. They are uh, very frustrated by the physician unionization efforts. Uh, and so there was a management meeting where an anti-union lawyer uh, came and spoke with the group about um, how to uh, address issues or how to respond when someone mentioned the union. Uh, and in that meeting, they spoke at length about how management needed to be pro-company, pro-corporation, and not pro-employee, and how important that distinction was. And so I asked, I said, you know, I, I'm interested in how in a time, uh, I think COVID has really shown us how dependent healthcare institutions are on the people that provide care. So how do we reconcile the need to retain our excellent people, to respect our excellent people with this concept of being pro-organization instead of pro-employee? For that, I was subjected to an hour long meeting um, and another write up uh, in the HR files for asking a question. And so that pattern continued uh, through the last month that certainly escalated. Uh, as I mentioned, we just welcomed into the world our second child um, who does have some significant medical issues that I'm dealing with. Um, and it's also beautiful and chubby and amazing. <laughs> and over the time that I took, uh, the earned PTO that I took to uh, be there for that process, I received a series of three certified letters from administration uh, continually threatening and harassing me for taking that earned paid time off to be there with my family during that time. 
Uh, the, uh, I was expected uh, back at work. And if I took any further PTO relatedly, that it would be considered job abandonment. Uh, at that point, I knew that I could not continue to take that risk to my family and my future career and made the difficult decision to resign from a job that I absolutely love. Um, upon making that, um, stating my resignation, uh, I was, I gave um, four weeks notice as is per our management policy. That gave me time to tie up things with the residency program that gave me time to notify my patients to make sure that people had other avenues for care. And then I was told that no, that Friday was my last day. Uh, my access was turned off and that I need to turn in my badge and, and keys to security by noon the following Monday. Um, so I came to do that, as I think was uh, many of you are aware, then escorted uh, off the premises by security. And I think while that was certainly challenging, certainly made me reflect very differently on my time with the organization, the worst part about it was that we had resident patients scheduled the next afternoon. All those patient appointments got canceled. We had resident clinics that I was to oversee that I was to precept for the, for the rest of the month that have been canceled. Uh, I had um, clinic patients scheduled. Uh, those patients don't know what happened to their provider. I am gonna be there for their appointment or where to go next for care. And while that is outrageous, I think the most important thing to remember is that that's just me. We know that we've had more than 100 colleagues uh, in the last two years, <laughs> year and a half, uh, over 150 employees that uh, are no longer with the organization. So that's not my story. That's the organization's story. And I think the other thing to remember is that it's not just people. I think people are clearly our greatest asset. I think we have a phenomenal group of people but those people are the ones providing services. So as we lose people, we're losing services. We've lost Wellspring uh, Recovery Center. We've lost our, our mobile outreach program that was providing services, uh, OB and podiatry services out to Pine Hill community and some uh, remote communities. Um, and you know, when I came to RCH in 2018, I came because RMCH was interested in starting a family medicine residency program. Uh, and I worked really hard actually to make that happen over several years. And I am deeply, gravely concerned that that program is at significant risk. I'm really, really worried that that may not be viable uh, in the current paradigm. And I think the other thing to remember is that the hospital is suffering really dramatic financial losses. And those things are all tied together. If we can't provide services, I have to stop saying we. If they can't provide <laughs> services, if they can't get patients scheduled in the clinic, if they can't the med search floor, if they can't admit patients to the ICU, that's where the revenue comes from. And so whenever we lose good people, whenever we lose services, it also compounds the really dire financial constraints that the hospital has been in for a long time. Uh, just one more thing that I wanted to mention about um, my series of, of certified letters uh, leading up to my resignation slash termination. Uh, there was a line in there that just particularly really bothered me, uh, where an administration let me know that they felt like they had extended every compassion in understanding my family circumstance. And that use of that term compassion in an organization where our frontline healthcare workers, day in and day out, we're picking up extra shifts. We're working in a situation where their patient couldn't call for help if they fell in the bathroom or had sudden chest pain. It just really unconscionable situations to be putting nursing and clinical staff in. And yet every day they came. During the COVID pandemic, they showed up and not only took care of the clinical care, but were the surrogate families for so many of our patients because we couldn't allow in visitors. We couldn't have our, our normal uh, <clears throat> ability to let patients be there at the bedside. Um, you know, I think many of you know, but one of the most clear 
incredible examples of compassionate care. Uh, our hospital chaplain, Chris Pickert, who's been with the organization for 18 years and has been at the bedside of hundreds of patients in their final moments, been the support for hundreds of families. Uh, and again, through the COVID pandemic, stood in and was the family for so many that couldn't have anyone there with them. Um, and she's not immune either. She's also undergone harassment, retaliation uh, from this administration. I think one of the things I reflect on is I try to understand, you know, what's the big picture here? How do we, how do we move forward? What's the root cause? I think of my time recruiting providers here as the chief medical officer. Uh, and Gallup is such, a, such an interesting place. You know, I would talk to a provider that, um, you know, had not really been here. And they'd say, oh, well, I, I Googled it. There's a high crime rate. Um, you know, I drove through on my way to the Grand Canyon. I don't really know what's in Gallup. And I think that anytime someone came and spent a week, did a month long resident rotation, spent some time and really got to know the people and the heart and soul of Gallup, it's an absolutely phenomenal community. Again, we've been here 12 years now and intend to be here uh, for our careers and, and our lifetime. Uh, and that's something that's easy to miss if you're not integrally involved in the community. And I think that that's also what happens from a management perspective. I think that outside corporate interests see Gallup um, as might still be on screen, <laughs> as I mentioned, as a small rural place, it's easy to take advantage of that no one's really gonna say anything, that they can just kind of come in and do what they want. And I think they're wrong. I think that you all are incredible evidence of that. Uh, and I think that there's so much more to Gallup than a small rural community where you need to be taken advantage of by corporate interests. One of the things that often gets said in those conversations, oh, well, we have to go outside the community because there's quote, no local talent, unquote. Look around this room, look around that hospital, look around our community. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a more bootstrappy, self-reliant, resilient group of people just about anywhere. So I'm tired of hearing, hey, there's no local talent. We've got to bring in people from elsewhere to, to help this you know, distressed small place. We have the people that we need right here. We have the people that care about this community. They're dedicated to our patients and making a healthier future for all of us. And the providers, the nurses, the clinical folks at the hospital, we can work anywhere. We choose to be here. We're here because we want to be here. For me, it's been a real heartbreak to have to leave the organization, the colleagues I care deeply about, the residency program that I was incredibly committed to, and my patients that I worry will have a hard time finding care without me there to provide it. But I'm not leaving Gallup. I'm not sitting down, I'm not shutting up. I'm gonna to continue to work every day to improve the healthcare of our community because I believe in a vision of a healthier Gallup. We need this hospital. We deserve excellent healthcare. We need leadership change before it's too late. We need to stop the CHC management agreement. We need to take back our hospital. We need local clinically based leadership, local governance, patient input. I think the patient advisory board is a really key intervention. Why are we not listening to our patients? Why objection to a patient advisory board where patients can come and say, this was my experience. This is what I think we need. We need community voices. We need your voices. We need growth. We need more services, not cuts. We need to retain, expand, and stabilize the excellent people that we have and the potential organization that we could. That potential is incredibly evident. The Chag, Dylan, Sarah, who was my roommate when we, when we isolated from our families for weeks and weeks living in the hospital basement, because again, we didn't know how likely we might be to bring a deadly virus home to our families. An excellent, vibrant hospital here at home is not some far off dream or something that requires you know, big city resources and outside uh, corporate management to make it happen. It's not a dream. It's a 100% achievable critical need for our community, 
the local economy, and for the future of Gallup and McKinley County. And we can attain this by putting our people, our colleagues, our community, our patients over profits. <laughs>